Welcome to Dark Sorcery. I'm Alfredo Martinez, and I have with me the one and only Anton Mastroianni. How you doing, Anton? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm doing great, and it's it's good to uh, be here to uh, have a little chat with you. Uh, he is the uh, owner of the uh, uh, channel Cult of Belial, and he also has a Facebook group, and uh, they're just growing uh, immensely. I'd recommend you guys check that out. Uh, we'll go ahead and get into that later. But first, let's go ahead and uh, start out, Anton. Uh, tell us a little bit about how your magical journey began and what got you into the occult, where you are today. Well, I believe it was around the age of 18, 17. That's when I had my first spiritual awakening. Um, I didn't even know what was happening at the start. I would see synchronicities or, of people and uh, friend groups and all around me, basically. And um, I had a little nickname called it for synchronicities called, uh, we called it loop because it would loop around and you'd see um, similarities and situations. But um, slowly it went from that to being guided by spirits, mainly Lucifer, um, to being shown how the world really is run and uh, sort of the direction it's going in, which is where it's led up now. So, as I'm having this um, sort of intense spiritual awakening, um, I was struggling with determining if this is real or not real. And I was sort of on the borderline of not coping with it. So that's when the spirits properly came forth, introduced themselves to me, and I started looking into the occult properly. I came across Michael W. Ford, and that was probably one of the first authors and occultists that actually um, got me very interested in this. And I started reading and studying from there and I've gotten to where I am now. That's great, that's interesting. Um, you know, I myself am uh, very familiar with Michael W. Ford's work and uh, have a number of his books. Uh, what would you say is, is the book from him that helps you out the most? I would say it's the book of Akaharu Vampire Magic. That really helped excel um, my astral projection. Um, also helped me gain a bit of my health back as well with um, Vampire Magic. Yeah, I'd have to say my favorite book from him is uh, Dragon of the Two Flames. I just, I really like that. I like all the artwork in it. Um, I've tried uh, a number of the spells in the book, which were very, very, very well um yeah it's i'm a, a fan of his as well um what would you say would you say that there is a big importance in making magic your own and not just going off of you know what other people say word for word um i feel it's important because you're adding your own energy and infusing it into the spell and when you do this it's going to be more correspondent to your spiritual dna so it's most likely going to be more powerful. But that's not to say using spells from other systems, like, uh, for example, a Sour Jar spell won't work or be powerful. It's just if you modify it and add your own special little touch to it, it will increase in power and be more compatible with your spiritual DNA, I reckon. Yeah, I think that some people underestimate how powerful they really can be. I think a lot of people tend to you know, put so much emphasis on what one person says or maybe a few people say. And, you know, they they miss out a lot on on developing themselves. You know what I mean? Even ascending themselves. I think that's that's kind of like a uh, blocking your growth to ascension. Wouldn't you agree? I 100 percent agree with that. This is a um, almost like a solitary path where we're meant to find ourselves and that doesn't just mean shadow work and all that good stuff. Um, it means creating your own style of magic, having your own way of doing things and understanding of things. So I 100% agree with that. Yeah, I would say in a way, I mean, it, it's kind of like it, it is, but not really kind of creating a new religion. If you just go off of just what other people say and do, you know what I mean? You're just going through the motions. It's just another person saying mm -hmm. it. Mary and, and, and all that, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, so I, I definitely yeah, I like what you're saying. Um, now, as far as divination goes, um, 
what method of divination do you use mostly? Um, well, most of the time I get my answers just straight from channeling. I'll usually get like a vision or a projection or they'll just straight up tell me. But the actual tools I'll use the most are pendulum and tarot cards, but mostly pendulum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, is there any, uh, do you have any, any unique, any, well, excuse me, give me your commentary on uh, the tarot in general and just uh, how reliable you think it is and, uh, and yeah, your opinion on it, on the method in general. Um, I think it's very reliable, very accurate. If you're able to shuffle correctly in a trance and feel when the time is correct to stop shuffling, because there's been times I've shuffled not focused correctly or gotten the right mindset and I've pulled out a spread and I've just yeah. felt that this is not the right spread. I've just pulled it back and continued reshuffling till I felt it's the right um, spread that I've pulled. I personally don't know many spreads. It's something I should work on, but I mainly do single card pulls or past, present, future readings uh, with tarot cards. Yeah. I mean, there's different spreads I'll do, but that's mostly what I'll do if I just need a quick answer to something. Uh, but the thing is, is that I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I like a lot of, uh, I consider it some good artwork for a, a good amount of time. And uh, mm -hmm. there's so many decks, you know. What would you say is your favorite tarot deck? Um, probably Judgment or the Death Card. One of those two, I think. What are you? I mean, like, 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 uh, I mean, like the, the deck in general, like uh, the right oh, the, the, deck. Um, probably that one, 100%. I've only used um, Alistair Crowley's deck. I can't remember the name of it and the Rider Weight one. So, from my experiences with both of them, the Rider Weight deck is my favorite. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I enjoy the Rider Weight. I mean, it, it's pretty simple, but I would have to, I would have to say, me personally, my favorite is the Necronomicon Tarot, just because I like uh, I like the artwork and I'm able to get some uh, some very clear answers with it through the imagery. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, it just works out in my favor. I just like the energy of it, you know. But um, you had mentioned uh, specifically the, the the death card and uh, the devil card, and what what appeals to you mostly about those two cards that? that stick out of the uh, the trumps um the things it's the actual artwork that sticks out for me i mean because when i had asked uh, we had started talking about the tarot earlier you had mentioned the the death card and then you had mentioned the devil card specifically um so my favorite thing or the thing that sticks out most about the death card is what it symbolizes of course um right. mainly people are afraid of death they're afraid of what comes after or if nothing comes after, right? But with the death card, it shows that death can be an illusion because most people, when it gets in their spread, they freak out. But they don't understand that death is a necessary thing and it's a part of nature and it's a balanced thing. It's all about dying off the old self or killing off the old self so we can transform and move forward like a snake when it sheds its skin it's no longer that form of snake it's something brand new the old snake died so that's what really sticks out for me most with the death card because when it appears in a reading it means that significant and major changes are coming in someone's life and just the energy of death um also scorpio i love all of it really so yeah yeah great um <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about candle magic so Candle magic can be, it's some very simple, but everybody kind of has their own method of doing it. There's really no right or, I mean, there's really no one way to go about that. Um, what type of uh, candle magic do you tend to rely on most of the time when it's needed? And uh, what would be, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, mainly I'll consecrate the candle by pushing just my energy into it or calling upon a force that is um, different from my own say for example i want to do a healing spell or a protection spell i'll call upon the powers of the sun in the middle of the day and i'll put the candles out 
and visualize a, a ray or a solar flare coming from the sun and touching the candle and imbuing it. Um, from there, I'll add whatever herbs or oils correspond to whatever I'm working or doing. And as I'm lighting it, I'll light it and gaze into the flame. I will visualize what I want, visualize the target if it's a baneful working, and further push energy into the candle flame until it burns out. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because the fact that so many uh, cultures from all over the world point at fire as a gateway to the spirit world. I mean, even in, in di just different cultures, like if you take a look at in the Bible, uh, you have Moses talking to the burning bush, you know, and just different different tales and stories of supernatural. Now, some people, you know, the reason I asked is because some people, when they do candle magic, they some people just don't focus on the on the candle itself. Some people will just focus on the flame and just work with the flame itself. Um, but I'm I'm guessing those are probably people who are more in tune with the uh, with the element of fire. Mm. more able to manipulate it better but uh okay and uh what would you say is the crystal that you you work with most in and why um it's definitely going to be quartz crystal because that's the most common crystal that i can get and it's the one i actually have the most um, I use it in all my workings pretty much um, to amplify and boost whatever I'm doing. I'll push energy into them or I'll make grids with them um, around the spell, uh, like an inverted pentagram or a pentagram, sort of stuff like that. Okay. All right. Do you prefer working with high or low magic? Um, I like working with both because they're both equally powerful and valid. But sometimes I do prefer low magic because it's a lot less to set up and you don't have to go through a whole ceremony, so it's a lot more practical. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Low magic for me, you know. I mean, we could do both, but it's just I don't know, what I prefer. Um, now, do you prefer more working with a deity or working alone? Um, I've never really worked alone. Since the start of all this, I did spirit work first before actually spell casting, and these spirits would guide me in all the spells I've done. Even if I try to do a spell without them, they'll just show up and start telling me kind of what to do <laughs> and overseeing the whole operation. So I'm never really working alone. Uh, that's good. Um me it depends on uh, the situation sometimes i'll work alone sometimes i'll work with the deity but uh you know that's just the way i do things but um now let, I'll, what i'd like to do is get your take on chaos magic. Uh, kind of explain in a nutshell what chaos magic is to you and if it's applied in your throughout your life um Chaos magic to me is taking flavors from other systems of magic and adding it into your own recipe of a spell. It's taking bits from spells that you can see around different cultures, things that uh, call to you or work for you, and incorporating them into something completely new. So it's almost chaotic in nature with the making and the designing of the spell and the outcome generally uh brings results for me at least yeah okay you know i would say in a way you know that's a kind of a bit of of every practitioner's life you know what i mean whether they want to admit it or not you know i think they end up doing it anyway yeah 100 percent um, mm -hmm. Um, now let's tell me a little bit of some moments in your, during your magical path where you just went, holy shit. You just had like a holy shit moment in magic. Quite a few of those. Um, I think the most, I've got two of them that are most, um, 
memorable. One was when uh, a glass just exploded in my kitchen because when I don't do banishings or cleansings at least once a week or a fortnight, it gets built up pretty big in here because these are beings of negativity, chaos, darkness, demons. Right. The energy that gets built up is destructive and chaos sometimes. So things will tend to move or break, sometimes blow up. Uh, the second one was when I went out one night and uh, I met someone. And at the time, I had this familiar that I didn't know his name. He'd follow me around. He was like this little black shadow with a stereotypical pointy tail, really goofy character. And he'd sit there as I'm meeting this person and he'd whisper in my ear, ask him if he's died, ask him if he's died. And I was like, I'm asking him that. That's awkward. I've just met this person. But he kept pressing and pressing. So I was like, fine, I'll ask him. Just stop asking me. So yeah. I've asked this person if he died. He looks at me and looks at his friend. And he's like, who's this person and how does he know me? I'm sitting there, like, smiling, like, uh, going, all right, here we go. And uh, as he's uh, said, who's this person, I got a flash, like, an energetic message from the familiar of how he died. And I saw, like, a, a cartoon needle, so to speak. So I asked him, like, did you die from this or almost die? And he started freaking out, going, yeah, like, I died twice in the hospital bed. So the whole reason the familiar wanted me to do this is because... He likes secrets. He likes to feed from people's secrets, but in turn, heal them at the same time. So it was a really weird experience. Oh, that was interesting. Yeah, I've, I've had, there's been a, a few times when I've been uh, been in in the uh, temple during ritual, and then all of a sudden, candle flame is that big, all of a sudden it goes that big, you know what I mean? Or almost hits the ceiling. I don't yeah. know if you've had that happen before, but that's happened to me a few times. Have you had the uh, sparks come from the candles as well? Where it just yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's like right before, right when you say an incantation, and then all of a sudden there's a spark that shoots out of the candle. It's like a confirmation. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I love just, when that happens. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, what would you say is your opinion on the the future of magic and the occult community? The future of magic and the occult community. Um. Where you, the, way you I, the way I see it's going is interesting. It's taking a whole different turn almost. It's really breaking down barriers that have been placed before, like uh, especially things that are like closed off to people. It's not as closed off. So mm -hmm. it's definitely bringing in a lot more people than it was 10 years ago, I think. Yeah. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think so, too. I think that it's really it's it's changing, you know, not only the way things are, the way people respond to situations, but just the mentality of the world in general is influenced mm -hmm. in a big part that way. Um, would you say that it has would you say that the, it's headed in a, a more positive direction or in a would you say that there's going to be a witch hunt or anything like that um it's possible there could be a witch hunt in the future with events going on it's starting to look closer and closer to that but i'm hoping it won't with here at least where i live there was i think someone who robbed a grave recently they uh broke in took two heads of dead people and that went all over the news because they left candles and a crucifix there and they were starting to blame a cult uh, and, and witches for it around the area. And then copycats started copying it. So it can lead to that pretty quickly, I suppose. But I don't yeah. think it will because people these days are more more progressive in the way they think. They're more, uh, how do I say, it's less taboo, I suppose, these yeah. days. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay. Now... Okay, let's talk a little bit about your uh, your Facebook group and uh, YouTube channel, They're both called uh, Cult of Belial, and then you have uh, Eternal Serpentry. And you go ahead and differ differentiate, excuse me, between the two. Um, well, Cult of Belial is more um, a group and a place for people to come 
learn and share with each other and to grow. Yeah. It's mainly, it's devoted for Belial, basically. He's the patron of the group. And my role is to essentially help people who seek him, find him appropriately and safely. Um, with Eternal Serpentary, that's more my own. I will share um, whatever I feel that needs to be shared or that I want to share. Um, but yeah. I plan on working on a lot more content and doing a lot more work and working together with you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I see that you're uh, up and coming and uh, your platforms, you know, some of your platforms seem to be growing fast. Um, and uh, so that's why I thought uh, it'd be a good idea for us to go ahead and do this video, you know, and just start putting it out there that, uh, you know, Dark Sorcery and uh, Eternal Serpentry uh, will be working together in the future. Um, 100%. They might see us, see us collabing more. Yeah, um, 100%. And what can we expect from you in the future? Um, hmm. I'm not sure what to say to that one. Um, you can expect me to just be me and to share knowledge. Just keep doing what you're doing. Yep, just keeping it real. Well, yeah, you're you're doing a good job at it. It's it's uh, it's definitely paying off. So, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for uh, tuning in. Uh, thank you, Anton. It's good to uh, have a chat with you. Thank you. It was good uh, doing this. Yeah, definitely. It's been fun. And uh, go ahead and like subscribe to uh, Dark Sorcery and Eternal Serpentry. Everyone out there, have a good day.